Hello and welcome back to Lawrence Plays Factorio Space Exploration with Crastorio 2. During the last stream, we hit a bit of a milestone with the endgame puzzle and spent some time thinking about and discussing what we've learned. And so in this video, I'm going to run through our current thoughts and touch on where we want to go from here. This means that the first part of this video will be full of spoilers, so if you're playing the game yourself and want to have your own crack at the puzzle, you might want to jump forward to the second chapter using the scroll bar at the bottom. For those of you who are still following along and want to see the depths of our mathematical despair, <laughs> let's get stuck in. And if you've already solved the puzzle or, you know, seen the answer elsewhere, please don't give us any spoilers, we do want to work this out for ourselves. This all started with Mike travelling to Angelus, another star system, to put down our eighth and final dimensional anchor. This required the usual giant field of solder, as you can see here, but it fired up just as you expect. I mean, uh, yeah, we've now got this, solar, this uh, dimensional anchor over here, blasting blue stuff off into the void and suitably anchoring the Stargate. And now that we've got the full set of anchors available, when we turn the Stargate on, and just keep, keep a little bit of an eye on it down here, you'll see when it finishes booting up, the lights will come on to tell us its current status. And there we go, we've now got all of the anchors we need and it's properly cooled as well because we're pumping in all of this uh, thermofluid to keep the whole system chilled down nicely. And so the first thing that we did was just try setting the stargates to a random set of, um, of glyphs around the edge here, using, using just whatever happened to be there and available to, to find out what would happen when we triggered it. And it sparked up nicely, it fired up, it went blue and swirly, and eventually it, it, it kind of opened. We made contact with the other side. Well, I say we made contact with the other side. Um, we actually just got a load of biters wandering through, and uh, then we had to, had to deal with them. And there wasn't anyone around to deal with them at the time, which is a little bit awkward, so we flew Mike in to give them a bit of a zapping. Um, and that went sort of kind of okay. Um, but I'm not sure how to turn the gate off, except for coming back over here and flicking the switch back off. And there we go, that's cut, that's cut the power to it. And so the, uh, the blue stuff is now shrinking. And unfortunately, the biters don't go away. We're probably stuck with them, at least until we send someone else out there to deal with them. Never mind, I guess that's what biters are for. And so I commented that we seem to have spent all of this effort and we've basically built a biter generator, which is lovely, just what we want. At this point, when all the biters came through, we decided it'd be a good idea to put some defences in around the gate. However, unfortunately, we didn't have any laser turrets available in Fenestra, so at the moment all we have is these ghosts around the edge here. And they're not very effective against the biters in the middle, so we'll just have to, um, have to come back later, put the lasers in, and then it'll be a bit more uh, self-contained, a bit more self-sufficient, and we'll be able to deal with the biters itself. Until then, I guess I might just have to go out there and, uh, and handle them myself. Okay, so we can open the gate. It's working nicely, but that doesn't bring us any closer to pointing it at the correct location. And this is where things start to get a bit more complicated. One thing we did notice is that when you trigger the Stargate, it tells you what vector you've opened down here at the bottom of the screen. And this is shown in the same XYZ unit vector format as the long range star mapping, so these are directly comparable. It's also the same format as we saw in the ship logs. If you look in the exploration journal, these are the logs we found from the crashed ship in Fenestra, which is still way off to the north there. You can see the same sort of standardised vector coordinates shown in here. So these are all using the same system, which means we can directly compare them. So this means we can kind of explore setting various different sets of glyphs on the Stargate and see if we can work out how the system works. So we previously, as you've seen, worked out that all the vectors for each glyph, they describe points on a unit sphere, naturally, since they're all normalised unit vectors. And so when we plot all these points, they show up quite nicely spread out across the surface of this sphere. The cartouches from the pyramids also suggest a sort of proximity between the glyphs. Each central glyph for a cartouche is surrounded by another 11, and we've already discovered that these proximities match between the cartouches and the coordinates from long-range star mapping. So if we find a glyph from our list in the star mapping, and then also find that same glyph as a central glyph from a pyramid's cartouche, if we then look at the 11 round that glyph on the cartouche, we'll find that their coordinates in the star mapping over here also match up quite nicely. So it appears that both systems are essentially different ways of visualising or different ways of giving you information on the same data, which makes a lot of sense. It'd be a bit weird if, if the glyphs refer to two completely different things, but it's nice to have this confirmation. Our first theory is that when you add a load of glyphs into the Stargate, they're all added together or averaged, or some, so, somehow they're all combined to give you an overall dis direction. So if you, for example, if you had one that was pointed north and one that pointed east, when you combine them, maybe that would give you northeast. And that made a certain amount of sense, um, at least in my head. And we'd also noticed that some of the vectors are exactly opposite each other. For example, man with sword, down here is the exact opposite of deformed scorpion up here. That is, they show exactly the same numbers, but with minus signs on one side and, not, and no minus signs on the other. So this one's, uh, the X is positive, negative, and here, and here we have the Y is negative, Y is positive, and here we have Z is negative, 
Z is positive, but the numbers all match up perfect, all the way through all the decimal places we have showing up here. If the theory about adding them up or averaging them or something like that is correct, if we program half of the chevrons with man with sword and the other half with deformed scorpion, they should all cancel out and give us some kind of undefined result because the unit vector of zero magnitude is, is meaningless. And so we tried that down here. As you can see, we've got two man with swords, two deformed scorpions, then two of these threes and these funny N things. That, that Those two also cancel each other out. But that gave us, well, you can see it's not zero. It's not undefined. There is clearly some sort of result has been gained from this. So clearly it's not doing what, what I thought it was doing. Another sensible thing to try at this point would be pointing them all in the same direction. So we did that here with these up arrows. And again, that is a different position on the circle to just the up arrow. So again, it's, it's clearly not just taking an average of them all because that would have given us exactly the same numbers as well. We did notice that the numbers were relatively close, but even so, they still they certainly didn't match and they weren't all they weren't all that close. The next thing we had to think about was that there are four glyphs sh that show up round the ring on the Stargate that don't appear in any of the pyramid glyphs, any of the pyramid cartouches, or any of the long-range star mappings, and so we think they might be something funny and slightly different. One of them is this sort of triangle target thing here, and then there's three different sort of A-shaped arrow type things, like this one, and this one, and this one, and they all feel diff they feel rather different for a couple of reasons. They, they feel like a slightly different style of glyph, and I can't really put my finger on exactly why. It's not because they have crossovers or anything like that, because lots of them have that sort of thing, but somehow they, they feel slightly different. But more importantly, they are ones that appear on the, uh, on the Stargate, but don't appear anywhere else, and so that makes them suspicious. So for our next experiment, we thought we'd have a bit of a play with those. And down here, you can see that we've got one of those four suspicious glyphs in the first position. So we've got a number of different chevrons around the edge here that we can load glyphs into. This one is one, we've been considering this on the first one because it's the one that makes the first light down here light up and it's the first one going around from the platform clockwise. And if we try and program that one in, then the thing will slide across. Uh, there's a little puff of smoke over here, but you'll see that hasn't been programmed in. It doesn't like these particular glyphs in, in these positions, so that's very strange. Can we put them anywhere else? So we rotated the, um, the Stargate round a little bit to put that A on its side in the, in the space up here, and we tried programming that one. And that worked absolutely fine. So yes, you can use them for programming up the Stargate, but for some reason this chevron down here in the bottom corner, the number one, won't accept those particular glyphs. We then discovered if we put a random glyph in the in the first position like this, and then fill all the rest of them up with this central target glyph, then the coordinates we get out as an output are exactly the same as the coordinates for this first glyph that we put in. So it turns out it looks as if putting in these target glyphs has absolutely no effect. This has given us a potential way to find out the coordinates of all of the other glyphs that we haven't managed to find yet through the long-range star mapping without spending phenomenal quantities of astro research. Instead, we can just plug them into the into the system here, put in that particular glyph, as you've seen on both these two, then a load of the target ones, and see what it reports back, because we will know that the uh, the one for the up arrow is 0.8 blah 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 blah. So we've now got a way of finding out the coordinates for all of the other glyphs that we haven't managed to work out yet, so that's really useful. Granted, finding them all out this way is a somewhat time-consuming process, but even so, I think it would be worth it. It's still going to be a lot less time consuming than trying to do it through uh, astro research. This, as I'm sure you can imagine, led to quite a bit of further head scratching, as not being able to put those glyphs into the first chevron, but being able to put them into other chevrons, suggests that the order of the chevrons matter. It's clearly not just add up or multiply or combine these coordinates to get the number you actually want. Perhaps it's, it's more like an IP address or a phone number, where as you get further into it, you're narrowing down to a smaller and smaller area. So to check this a little bit further, for our next test, we re revisited the idea of inverse vectors and programmed deformed scorpion and man with sword and then a long string of the the no effect glyph as well. This gave us a vector that was, again, it was sort of close to deformed scorpion, but it was definitely not the same, and also definitely not a zero or an undefined. So we're pretty sure at this point, we can't use one glyph to completely cancel out another one and just make them not count. If we want to have nulls in there, then these uh, target glyphs are quite good. However, you can't put them in the first position. So we're gonna have to come up with some sort of actual valid proper answer for this. And so after some further thought, further pondering, we came to our current working theory. So, there are 60 normal glyphs that we've discovered on our travels in the pyramids or from long-range star mapping. And so we think our sphere of coordinates is a regular dodecahedron that's a 12-sided solid consisting of 12 pentagonal faces. Each of these pentagons we're then sort of mentally dividing up into five triangles, which gives us 60 triangular faces in total, one for each glyph. 
We then suspect that each face has an associated glyph with the vector for that glyph pointing to the center of that face, the center of the triangle. And further to this, the unexplained glyphs, the sort of the target ones and the A-shaped pieces, they represent different points on the triangle, with the target one being the center of it, which would explain why a glyph followed by seven targets results in the same coordinates as the original glyph. You're essentially saying point at the center of this triangle and then look at the center of the triangle again and again and again and again and again and again. And so it's just staying in the middle of that triangle. Whereas if you use a different one, it's pulling it off somehow in some direction or another. From this we made the leap of logic to suspect that the A-glyphs are actually arrows and they all represent different corners of the triangle you're looking at. And they do visibly point in different directions, which I could sort of convince myself were about 120 degrees apart, so you know, pointing at the three corners of the triangle. However, we're still trying to puzzle out how these stack. Do you end up splitting the triangle into smaller and smaller triangles with each chevron? What will putting another location glyph mean in this context? If you keep pointing at the corner of the triangle, will it stay in the same place? Given that we think that the target one keeps you pointing in the same place, if we had a corner and then a, and then a target, which is the centre one, would that be the same as a corner and a corner? We don't really know at this point, so we're going to need to carry on look looking into that and trying to work out what it all means. Additionally, Tristan has noted that if you take all of the triangle cartouches from the pyramids, that's the bottom part that's triangle shaped, you can sort of put them together like a jigsaw puzzle by matching up the edge pieces or the edge pieces to the centre pieces. And if you do that with the whole lot, you get this triangle shape with, all, as you can see, these are all the triangle type glyphs on here. And so perhaps you can use this to select where you are inside that triangle, or maybe use it to select which bit of the triangle you want to analyse next. So you can repeat it as many times as necessary, each time essentially just zooming in a little bit further. And of course, each main glyph is associated with a triangle glyph from finding the cartouches in the pyramids. So that would allow you to select an appropriate position in the triangle by selecting the appropriate circle pyramid glyph that goes with the triangle glyph you're interested in. The first glyph you enter does seem to dominate the position of the output vector, and so it seems that the further in you go, the less effect they have, which makes sense if you're sort of zooming in and getting more and more precise about where you're pointing and going to a smaller and smaller triangle each time. But if we're going to work out how to enter the vector to take us home, we're going to need to do a lot more thinking and work out how to use the subsequent glyphs to narrow down the desired output and get it to point exactly where we need to go. Having solved the interburbulator mystery a while back, we're also looking for ways that the two puzzles could be related, as it would be a nice bit of game design if the interburbulator was a gentle warm-up for the more difficult endgame version with the Stargate. So far, we've got as far as noticing that both puzzles have vectors intersecting planes, but otherwise there doesn't seem to be a great deal of overlap between the two. We'll keep working on it though, and uh, update you again next week to let you know how we're getting on. I should also mention as a brief aside that uh, during the last stream, Tristan checked out the last remaining pyramids. So he's been out to Trostorus, Nostos and Geras, where he got one of each of the three module types. So that was a nice, neat finish for him. And that means between us, we've now been to every single pyramid, screenshotted the cartouche in it, and made a big pile of screenshots that we can rummage through whenever we want to try and work something out. So, um, so that's nice. Uh, we just need to work out what to do with them all now. And welcome back to anyone who's avoiding spoilers, and so let's carry on now by taking a bit of a look at Taras, because as well as thinking about puzzle things, I also played, you know, played some actual Factorio, which is quite nice. And one of my big things I wanted to do was try and get everything running nicely over here on Taras, get a better supply of Immersite flowing out, because we had a shortage of it. And as you can kind of tell by these belts, that wasn't very successful, and I shall touch on why in a moment. But first, I want to mention that I did go in and do the uh, silicon extraction that I was talking about before. So over here, we now have a, a set of belts running around here. We're pulling some of the waste sand that's coming out of the processing and was previously just being dumped onto this belt and then was being dumped onto this belt, converted into glass and dumped back onto the belt. Uh, we're now taking at least a bit more of that. Some of it's going into here. It's being converted into quartz and then into silicon because we need silicon for making the crystals. But also, we, this system here is capable of making the silicon a bit faster than it's actually needed up here. And so, yes, I prioritised the belts up here so to make sure that we prioritise the crystal production because that is the the thing that's important here but then any spare silicon if we're making it faster than that can then be dropped out onto here where it will then be set put out onto these two disposal belts and this one feeds it onto the same disposal belt that's taking the sulfur no that's taking the crystals away in fact which is a little bit brave but there was a lot of spare space on the belt so I thought that would be absolutely fine but if it ever does fill up we can also dump it onto this belt down here which will put it onto the other disposal belt that takes away all of the miscellaneous byproducts from core processing um, and this one well this one was rather full which is why I put in the other overflow up here but my expectation is that we will pretty much always be transporting crystals away because we use them in such quantities so this should probably be okay. Once again we have a, a limit on this so this belt here is being controlled with saying only send silicon through if there is less than 20,000 on the signal and the signal is being brought over from Norvis as before um, and at the moment 
well, we don't have we don't have any over there in the other storage system. So we 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 so at the moment we quite like to have lots and lots of it, please. So this system is going to run steadily whenever there's a, whenever it can, whenever there's sand available. However, unfortunately, there is currently no sand. And looking through this, we've I've eventually tracked it down to there's a shortage of mineral water. You see, this pipe, despite having an icon on it, is completely empty. And so we we we're producing mineral water in in a couple of ways. One of the ways is it's coming out of the core processing over here, but unfortunately it seems that core processing doesn't produce enough to keep the entire system running. And now it's possible that it used to. Maybe the core processing used to produce enough mineral water, however, now I started pulling in these belts that aren't imosite core chunks, but are just raw imosite, the stuff that comes out of the core processing, now we've got quite a lot more flowing through, so maybe that's why we've run into a problem here. Previously it was also okay, because we had a supply of mineral water coming from up here, from these pump jacks. Unfortunately, these pa this patch has now run completely dry, so we don't have any more to be brought from here, and that is why we've run out. So I had a bit of a think and a bit of a look into how we we're going to get more mineral water onto this planet, because that's basically what we would need to do. And there are a few mineral water patches around, and some of them are a reasonably good size, they're just quite hard to spot. There's one over here, for example, with a million in it, which is not an enormous amount, but it's a decent amount, it'll probably keep the factory going for a while, but it's blooming miles away. The amount of time, it, the amount of time and effort it would take to run a mark pipe from here all the way down through here, around this way and down here, it's a bit crazy. And it would be horrible for UPS. It'd be horrible for throughput. It'd be just generally horrible. The correct way would, of course, be putting a train system, do it with that, and have have everything done on this planet by train. But it's a bit, it's a bit too late for that sort of thing. So yeah, basically, whilst there are a few mineral water patches on this planet, I think there's another one down here, a similar sort of distance away. Um, problem is, they look quite a lot like iron ore on the map. Uh, maybe we should install one of those mods that uh, highlights resource patches for you. But yeah, there are, there are a few patches out there that are of a decent size, of the sort of the the six or seven figures range. But they're all they're all absolutely miles away from the uh, from the from the base where we actually want to do stuff. And I don't think there are any that are a, decent, a decently short distance away where it would be reasonable to then bring it in by in, in a pipe. And so I decided the best idea here, and you'll never hear me say this again, would be to take a leaf out of Mike's book. And so back over in Norbit, I've started doing a bit of redesign work on the Taras spaceship to put in a mineral water tank in them like this. So the ship can fly and it can land here. And then we've got a set of pumps here that will pump, pump mineral water from this tank out here into the ship. And in order to fit this in, I've removed one of the three warehouses and replaced it with a, with a, with a huge storage tank. And that gives us the, the capacity to then carry this stuff out and then unload it at the other end. This wasn't too difficult, it just meant I needed to pull out the pull out the warehouses, make sure I didn't break all the uh, the cabling that's running here to make sure the system uh, runs properly. Uh, Mark did tell me that I'd now voided the warranty on this particular spaceport, and so if it doesn't work it's not his problem, which seems fair to be honest, but I'm reasonably sure I've got everything hooked up correctly. I still have the output warehouse over here because I'm sort of part way through at the moment, and at the time I did this I hadn't updated both of the spaceships. I wanted to make sure that I, uh, they were able to land here, unload anything they brought with them, and then and then be ready to fly off again before I started modifying them. So we would always be able to unload stuff here, and I wouldn't be trying to unload a warehouse full of Immersite with logistic spots, because that way lies madness. And so I have updated the other ship as well. We've now got both ships are swapped over to being mineral water ships, and this ship has come over with some mineral water, and it's unloaded it all here. Um, I was trying to put in three tanks, but I ran out of underground pipes. I'm going to have to come over here with more stuff and just finish this off, because it, it's not quite there yet. But the plan is that I'm going to have a, a supply, the supply of mineral water being pulled out here in, in, by the, um, by the, from the spaceship through, through the pumps and then we'll put in, I'm putting in another station down here. We've got in the storage tanks down here that can store large quantities of mineral water, it can then be pumped into the train. I need to wire these ones up so they don't pump at the wrong times. A little bit of logic is going to be needed down here just to make sure they only push it across at the right times. I didn't want to just run pipes between them because I feel like that would be a rather slow way to get the uh, get the mineral water over to the final tank. But th this system, will pro I can probably make this work reasonably well. Um, I also ran out of locomotives, which is why there's an extra fluid wagon in the middle here. However, I don't feel too bad about that, because these are maglev trains, so you only ever need one locomotive. I don't know why previously the trains have been designed with an extra locomotive in the middle, apart from inertia, because that's how we designed them over on Norfis, where we weren't using maglevs. And so that, there's also an empty wagon on this one, because I nicked the locomotive out of the middle of here to put on the front of this one, because, as I said, I didn't have enough bits and pieces there. Now, that does seem to have broken this. I don't know why it hasn't left. Oh, it's been put on manual, that's why. Uh, so it's filling up up here. It can it can then be ready to head down. To, it is now ready to head down to Terra. So if I tell it to go to the station, we'll get that second of inactivity, and then it'll drop down with all the uh, all the rare metals that are apparently needed down on the planet. So yeah, the, the system still works more or less as it did before. Um, it's just now got a slightly funny looking train, and we'll never end up we'll end up never using the middle wagons on these two. But never mind. Anyway, once I get all the pipes and everything in place, so we can run a pipe down here and go into these tanks and get them all 
wired up properly to, to pump everything through. We'll then have a supply of mineral water that we can take down to the planet. And down here, I've started specking things out a little bit. I've put in, a, I've put in an extra piece of rail that comes around here, and this is going to be where the, uh, the train will come around with the mineral water to park here, unload it over here, and then it can be pumped around into the system to go, to go wherever it's needed to allow us to start making the Immersite again. And so I think that should be should be a fairly good fix. It should everything should work once I've done that. It's just a little bit of a faff to get through get all get through all the steps. But I reckon that was probably less faff than it would have been to go out all the way out to these these patches way off in the distance over here. I did have some suggestions from people in on on stream from people in in, in the chat suggesting that maybe I should just you know use another spaceship to bring it out and. That is probably a fair suggestion. I mean, it certainly makes sense. It's a reasonable suggestion. I, but I quite like the elegance of having just a single ship that does everything. And okay, it's now got another one that does exactly the same stuff as well because one ship didn't have enough throughput. But in theory, it's still one ship is doing all of the things for Taras. And I think that's quite nice and quite neat. Yes, I do have multiple ships for Talos, but that's significantly more complicated and has significantly higher throughput of stuff being taken out there. So that's its own special case. I was going to say, we've now got to a point where the inputs for the quantum processors are sufficient to keep the system running happily. We've got enough holmium coming in that, well, this, this, this was running solidly when I last looked at it. However, it's now clearly suffered from the uh, Immersite crystal shortage, and also it seems to have a bit of a uh, holmium uh, plate shortage as well. So this obviously is not quite as solved as I hoped it was. Um, we may need to just carry on throwing more, more bits and pieces at it, but we do finally have enough Holmium cables up here. So I'm going to need to take a look at the Holmium, Holmium ingots, see why they're not being brought up. I suspect it's just because this train has got bored waiting down on the ground and isn't coming up yet. Yes, here it is, just sitting here waiting, twiddling its proverbials. It's got about 2,000 Holmium ingots in it, but it's not actually full, and therefore it's not leaving. So I guess this is another case of we need to increase the shopping list slightly, ask it to bring a few, a bit more of that up, and then it'll be okay. But we're then going to immediately run out of Immersite crystals, so it's kind of moot at this point, at least until I get that running up, up and running properly again. So <laughs> we've made some, uh, we've made some good progress with getting the um, quantum processors up and running, and we do appear to now have at least enough holmium to keep things reasonably happy. However, that's just bumped the problem onto a slightly different stage. I did try to help the quantum processor system a bit by um, by looking at where these trains were going. And it turned out one of the drop-off points for quantum processors is over in the biological science. And it was previously here, this now stripped bare um, piece of track here. And that was pumping out quantum processors that were then going up a, pop, a belt all the way up here and then being taken in over here to make these AI cores, which were being fed over to a train. And this is now filled up and, jam and jammed up. We've got enough AI cores. However, there was a long, long, long belt coming all the way down here that would eventually be filled up with quantum processors. And so it seemed like a good idea, in order to save on uh, the number of quantum processors we just have sitting on belts and things, to move the entire station all the way up to here. And, well, it seems to have worked. We've, got, we've now got a big pile of them up here. I think that is a deactivated station. It is. You can see it's gone red there. So yes, that has worked. We've now got enough quantum processors to keep this area satisfied and that means we can start taking, taking them away to other places that need them like science production and advanced data card production and so on and so on without worrying about just dumping enormous quantities of them onto a belt over here which is, would be kind of wasteful. This leads quite neatly on to a, a modification Tristan made over here. Where, I say modification. Now over here, Tristan gave this train a nudge because it had a decent number of the various data cards in it. Okay, it's clearly not four, but it's got at least 100, it's managed 130 quantum computing data and it presumably had a little bit more than that. So Tristan gave it a nudge. He told it to clear off, go over to the advanced science card drop, which is way over here in the science area. And that meant we were able to make at least some of the advanced science packs. And you can see actually up here, we have we actually have a full belt of catalogs here. The, okay, the, the belt doesn't go back all that far, but there is still enough of the uh, the quantum processor data that the system is, is quite happy at the moment. So things seem to be going pretty well for the, from the science point of view. Um, we've got enough that we've, up here, you can see we've actually finished the science. So that's that's pretty good. And now we're not we're not actually doing any research at the moment. But yeah, things, things are looking pretty good. For the first time in a while, we've actually got enough of all the science packs. Although I do notice that the uh, Deep Space 2s are quite low and are, but are being filled up again. So cautiously optimistic about those. We'd probably better take a look at them next time though. Similarly, there was a problem with the, uh, the matter supply train. So matter science is a weird one. One of the things you have to bring in is a quantity of scrap because it uses that as one of the ingredients for producing the matter science. And to me, that seems pretty weird, but you know, it, why not? I guess it's just, it's just another ingredient, it's another item. Why not use it? I'm, I, I don't have a problem with that. However, over here, where it's being picked up from the recycling area, and when I say over here, I actually mean over here, um, 
there was a problem with the belts passing it through and we weren't able to load the train properly over here. And it was because somehow a, a broken train battery had made it onto the scrap belt and had made it through to here to get into this warehouse and then had been tried to be loaded onto the train but it couldn't be put on the train which meant it was jammed in this loader which meant that this loader wasn't running, it wasn't loading the train up with scrap and the whole thing froze and broke and came to a halt. So Tristan's tidied that one up as well. He's pulled the dead battery back out of this warehouse and he's also put filters on these two loaders to make sure it never happens again. So even if some random junk does end up in the, in the warehouse here, we can, we'll only ever be unloading scrap onto the train. So it's made it a bit safer, a bit more proofed against any future similar problems. Although come to think of it, I'm not quite sure why one dead battery would cause it to jam up. Maybe there were two dead batteries, because there'd have to be one on either side, otherwise it would just run at half speed and that would be much harder to notice and therefore sort of worse was at least this way, it was a big enough problem that things broke and we went over and found out what the problem was and fixed it up. And I'm going to call this the end of the video. I think that's been a decent amount of time to be talking for. I hope all our work on the puzzle has been uh, suitably interesting and, uh, and has melted your brains as much as it's been melting ours. Tomorrow there is going to be an extra stream. This is a supporter stream where we should be playing uh, what, we're going, what we're calling a lazy spoon run. And I think that's a fairly common term in the Factorio community. So I'm, not, I'm certainly not claiming to have come up with it. But that's where we try to do both Lazy Bastard Run, which is where you handcraft less than 111 items across the whole game. And also there is no spoon, which is where you launch a rocket within eight hours. So our plan is to try and do both of those inside a single um, inside a single game. There'll probably be at least four of us playing. If you're a channel supporter and you'd like to join in, uh, give me a shout on the Discord. You'll be you're very welcome to come along and play as well. And we're going to try and pick up any other achievements that anyone might be missing as well. So I know getting on track like a pro is on the list. I think I need to do the bullets only, no laser turrets one. I certainly need to do the burn down a bajillion trees one. And there's a few others besides. So we're going to be trying to go through and get all of those uh, all of those achievements. And this feels like a sensible thing to do before Factorio 2 comes out. And May well have its own set of achievements at some point in the future. Then on Sunday I'll release another one of these videos where I'll be short talking about some of the other stuff we've been doing because we went out and explored some ruins which is interesting and there's always the uh, always the discussion of what's been going on with all the various supplies and things. I don't think this is going to be a three video week so I'm giving you an extra stream instead to, uh, to compensate. <laughs> Then on Monday we'll be back with another Factorio K2SE stream where we should be going, going through and trying to continue with solving the puzzle and maybe try and get the Emma site flowing as well. I think the puzzle is currently the priority. We, you never know, we might find that we're able to finish it fairly soon and don't need to do any more um, actual research. We've now basically done all of the non-infinite researches, so it's not vital for us to do any more for our uh, completeness sake. Then on Wednesday I'll be back to play some more Satisfactory as well and things are going well there. I'm on to the, the, final, the final stages of the game now. I'm trying to build up all the final things you need to get the, to satisfy the elevator for phase four um, and so I'm going to need to go out and make something called nuclear pasta in the next one which sounds like some sort of radioactive spaghetti so we'll see how that goes I'm sure it will involve a lot of spaghetti so please come along to uh, watch and support that stream be great to see you there and of course make sure you're subscribed to the channel so you don't miss out on any of the other shenaniganry that goes on here well, thank you very much for watching I'll see you next time bye bye <laughs>